بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد خير الاولين والاخرين وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا من فعل بما علمتنا وزدنا علما اللهم زدنا ولا تنقصنا واكرمنا ولا تهنا واعطنا ولا تحرمنا واثرنا ولا تؤثر علينا وارض عنا وارضنا يا رب العالمين ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله رأي عظيم سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العين الحكيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome back um, for this uh, continued study of the Aqidah of Imam Tahawi um, before we begin I wanted to first and foremost uh, offer my um, uh, expressions uh, my deep deep uh, sincerely held uh, expression of gratitude towards all of you who helped us achieve our goal uh, during Ramadan. Uh, we were uh, attempting to raise 25000 and alhamdulillah, we, we exceeded our goal. Um, and um, by a little bit, you know, I can't remember exactly the number, I think we made 26000 and and that was because of your help. Um, and uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he bless you for your support. May he accept your prayers, your fasts, uh, in your um, standing, in your recitation uh, during the month of Ramadan, all of your charity, and may he multiply it and return it to you many fold, inshallah. So um, we uh, are very, very thankful for all of that support and um, look forward to seeing uh, new things from us as well, inshallah, as we promised during this year. Um, Alhamdulillah, um, we return today to this class, this course entitled um, the renewing the faith, renewing uh, renewing faith, uh, um, study of Imam Tahawi's uh, his creed, uh, renewing faith um, in a faithless world, uh, and uh, we we've been on a break as we we see we've had a little bit of a break, and um, some of that was because of of course I, I, I felt a little bit of a pretty pretty difficult cold that I was working with and then we had graduation ceremonies uh, this past weekend and so so we t today we do typically don't have the course on uh, mondays you know but today i figured that you don't want to go uh for too long uh on a break so that uh people um sort of uh uh, just sort of lose the the discipline of actually tuning in to learn more about the creed of the Muslims, the creed of Islam. So, so today we're going to return to a study of Imam Tahawi's creed, um, and we want to uh, talk about many things. But among those things we want to talk about today is the issue of faith and what is intended by faith, and the um, and the. Uh, uh, and the uh, the words of the theologians, um, and why it is so important, what aspects of faith are essential, the integral to uh, ensuring that an individual uh, is truly a believer and what things are not integral to that definition. Uh, but before doing that, I did want to uh, do a little bit review, and we're gonna start today from verse number 77, and in the, translation of Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, may Allah preserve him. Um, and uh, this particular verse, it says, As for the virtuous among the believers, we trust that God will pardon them and admit them into paradise by, by his grace. Of course, because no one enters paradise because of his or her deeds. We enter paradise because of Allah's grace, or we say his mercy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he um, is not obligated to do anything. Uh, so even though he promises the believers that if you do good, that your reward uh, will be in kind. And if you do ill, then your reward also will be in kind. Uh, and so that itself is a promise from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't break his promise. You know? But Allah is not compelled to do anything. You know? So when we talk about um, how good deeds are uh, the foundation or the basis for or the catalyst for entry or the key to the entry into the garden. And then uh, we also talk about how no one enters the garden 
unless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows that person mercy, that it, it, at first this may seem like a contradiction, right? It's like, okay, well, we're being taught in the Quran that if you uh, do good, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to give you Jannah. And if you do the opposite, he's going to give you the fire. But when we learn from the Messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not allow anyone entry into the garden unless he does so through his mercy, right? No one, but what, what this means is that although Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his promise uh, is never broken, uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not compelled to do anything. So it's a reminder that Allah has absolute power and absolute will to do what he pleases. And so, so and there's a, a famous hadith where the Prophet asked one of his companions, uh, do you know what the right of God is over his servants? Uh, uh, do you know what the right of, uh, of God is, is over his servants uh, or the God's right over people? You know, and he says, um, tell me what is the right that God has over his people? And he says, uh, uh, and, 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 um, and uh, that they worship him and they not ascribe partners to him. And then he says, do you know what the right of people uh, over God? And then he says, Ya Rasulullah, so teach me, you know, Allah and his message knows, knows, knows best. And he said that the right that people have over, over God is that, is that, uh, that he did not, that he will not punish them if they do not associate partners with him, right? And, and so this haq or this right that we talk about that the, uh, he, a human being has over the creator, you know, of course, this is not a right in the same sense that we would understand it between people, right? Because you can compel people to fulfill your rights. Uh, you can compel people to uh, fulfill their obligations. Yeah, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cannot be compelled to do anything. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the messenger alayhi salatu salam stating that Allah has a particular right fundamentally is self is a reinforcement or to reinforce that Allah's power and Allah's will are absolute and nothing and no one uh, interferes or can compel him to do anything. So, so when Allah says, this is your right, it's the right that I have given you, that I've decided that this is your right over me, not something, uh, not based upon some objective moral criteria uh, that, that's out there, you know, and uh, some, some objective ideas or definition of justice, you know, without which uh, God would be classified as unjust, but Allah is never unjust, regardless of what he does. He does what he wills. So, so, so the virtuous among the believers, we trust that God will pardon them and admit them into the, bar, in, into the paradise by his grace. Uh, we do not, however, assume that about them, nor insist that they are in paradise, unless, of course, the Quran or the Sunnah expressly states that so-and-so is in paradise. Right, and so we're going to come to this later, inshallah, with regard to many of the Sahaba uh, who were promised Jannah, uh, and uh, and the same thing with respect to people who go to the fire. And we and while we fear, and we pray for the forgiveness of the sinful among them. So you can be a believer and be sinful first and foremost. You know that sin itself does not put you out of Islam. You know, but if you do commit sin, especially if you are, um, um, you know, become slavish to your sin. Uh, then uh, we fear uh, for your punishment. We fear for your salvation, right? You know, so we pray for those people, pray for their forgiveness uh, of the sinful among them. And while we fear for their salvation, we never engender in them despair. We never tell them that what you've done is unforgivable, right? You know, it's unforgivable to you. It's not unforgivable to the creator of all things, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has his own criteria for determining who is uh, to be forgiven or who can be forgiven. And who cannot be forgiven. And then he goes on and says, um, you know, actually another version of this reads, and when actually sort of there's a rhyme that goes along with it. And so it says, assurance and despair both displace one from con from the congregation of Islam. For Muslims, the path of truth lies between them. You try to mean lies between hope and despair, as we mentioned before, uh, or the assurance and despair uh, that uh, we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, khawf and wa out of fear and out of hope, right? You know, out of fear of his punishment, out of hope for his reward. Um, and um, we don't say for certain that 
I'm going to go straight to the to the garden. We don't say uh, that someone for certain is going to go straight to the fire or the person is never going to come out of fire, especially if you're talking about believers. We already know that believers will come out of the fire, even if they have a, the slightest amount of faith in their hearts. The slightest amount of faith will be enough uh, salvation for them. But we don't want to go to the hellfire for any particular uh, amount of time. Right. So this is a verse that we've already covered. And so there's a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, that if the believer truly knew uh, the extent of Allah's punishment, how severe his punishment is, then not a single person would entertain uh, the idea that they would enter the paradise. Right? That you wouldn't, it wouldn't appear to you. You would just say that, you know, there's no way in the world I'm going to make it, right? You know, if you know how severe, if you know, if you truly knew how severe the last punishment was, then you would not, you would, you know, the individual believer, you know, would would, would think that they would never enter paradise. But then he goes on, he says, that, that, and if the non believer, if the non Muslim, was aware of the extent of Allah's mercy, then not a single person would ever uh, lose hope in entering paradise, right? So, so, so there's a fear and hope, right? There's a balance between the two that we're not presumptuous. You say, oh, well, of course, Allah is going to forgive me. I believe in this. I believe in that. You know, there's no doubt. You know, um, and then it, and we also don't say that that there's no doubt that this person is among the companions of the hellfire. Right? You know, we can't say that. And then he goes on and he says, well, A believer does not lose his faith except by denying that which made him a believer. Uh, and so as mentioned before, what makes you a believer is the shahadatain. La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. Right? So um, for you to deny one or both of those things would put you out of Islam. And aqidah itself or the study of aqidah or al-kalam uh, it is said to be a summary or a, not a summary, but an exposition of La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah wa qawlu la ilaha illallah Muhammadan arsala u idahu yishma'u kulla hadihin ma'ani kanat lida alamat al-iman So it is a, a an exposition uh, of the shahadatain, right? So the thing that puts you out of faith or puts you out of faith is the thing uh is to deny the thing that brought you into faith. But imano huwa al bil lisani mutasdiqu bil janan. And faith, faith entails assertion with the tongue and conviction in the heart. Right. So here, Imam al-Tahawi, he fundamentally um, uh, has made part of the, the definition of faith two fundamental things. Um, what is something, an utterance upon the tongue and a conviction that happens in the heart, right? So a combination of the two, as if to imply that uh, if you only believe and only you know you believe, uh, that you would not be classified as a believer. Um, uh, you would not be classified as a believer because it, until you come out publicly and you state that you are a believer. Now, that opinion did exist Right in the past, among certain um, heretical sects of Islam, uh, 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 but um, the, the the truth is that, and the, the truth is that the, the main uh, integral, the main element of faith, the most important element of faith, is conviction in the heart. Conviction in the heart. Uh, now, the Quran, for instance, talks about how man kafar billahi ba'd imanihi. So, so in other words, uh, the verse goes and it says that that um, the one who um, rejects faith after having faith, except for the one who is compelled while his heart remains firm in faith, uh, but the individual who comes out and expressly states uh, kufr or re re unbelief, you know, this is the one on which Allah's his wrath and his anger, uh, it, it, it comes, right? Um, um, and so this particular verse actually, it tells us quite a bit, which is that 
Um, you can actually say something which is classified as kufar, unbelief, while excuse me, while still maintaining the uh, your faith, you know, and with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah knows that you're faithful, you know, especially if you're uh, rejecting faith on the compulsion, right? So it's because of compulsion you get this excuse. Right? So, so in other words, why? Because your heart is mutmainun bil iman, right? It is firm with faith. It is has has conviction and faith, right? Um, um, so you're only doing this because you're trying to remove an obstacle, right, from you uh, coming out publicly and um, you reject and um, uttering your faith, you know. And also we know, as I related the one verse about the man. The believer from the people of Pharaoh, right? And a man, um, a believing man from the people of Pharaoh who was concealing his faith, right? In other words, you know, he in his heart he believes, right? So Iman is fundamentally in the heart, right? But now let's let's also disabuse ourselves of certain um um types of sophistry that exist there. Because you come across people, you know, people will say, okay, well, you know, um, um, I have a good heart, right? Um, you know, the Muslims, and uh, they know that as a Muslim that you have the obligation to fulfill your five prayers, fast Ramadan, uh, among other things. Uh, but when you ask them, okay, why don't you do them? They say, okay, well, you know, well how did I have, 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 have me? I give me, my heart is good. You know, my heart's in the right place. You know, I'm a good person, right? You know. And they think that that itself vindicates them, right? Um, but the truth is that if they were tr truly good people, they would give uh, the rights or give the one who truly deserves um, to be uh, shown gratitude, uh, do gratitude. And that is the creator of this person, the individual who opened their eyes in the morning, the one who keeps their lungs working, the one who brought them into this world and fashioned them from a microscopic being, right, into what we have we see uh, today, right? Uh, uh, the one that makes your eyes work and your ears work, um, uh, your vocal cords, um, your reproductive, your digestive system, your circulatory system, your nervous system, all of these things uh, be maintained, sustained by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala involuntarily uh, to you. For you, there's, there's no, none of that falls under your capacity or under your will, right? You know, that these things happen, these are involuntary actions happening throughout your body, right? Uh, you have no control over it at all, right? Now, of course, you can, to some extent, you know, your, you can have an effect on your, uh, your respiratory uh, system or your circulatory system. You, know, you can do some things that are impede this, but, you know, you're not uh, making it work the way that it works, right? It continues to work because the lost pound to continues to do that, you know? So, um, it's, it's a question that comes up often too about uh, non-Muslims, for instance, they die and uh, they know about Islam and they still choose to not accept Islam, knowing the consequence of it. And, but we know them to be good people, right? You know, they, they gave charity, they, they help people, they help people feel, um, uh, you know, that they were worthy, worth something in their lives. And we say, okay, why would something like that go to the hellfire? say, well, um, because they themselves refused to do the, one of the simplest things in the world, and that was to acknowledge their creator, right? Because yeah, it's easy. Actually, to be totally honest, I mean, salvation is easy, right? La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah is easy, right? You know, if you believe that, right? And I often tell non-Muslims, listen, that if you believe that and you're just not ready publicly to come out to profess it, then you... You know, say it to yourself. You acknowledge it with, with Allah. You make you make amends with your Creator, right? In, in private, right? If you're if you're uh, you know not brave enough to come out publicly yet, right? And between you and God, that's sufficient. Of course, we can't do anything for you after you die because we didn't know you to be a Muslim, right? So the rights that are due to you, we can't do anything about them, right? But because iman, the essence of iman, is in the heart, right? Then that in itself will suffice those people, Yom Qiyamah, inshallah, you know, so, but what happens is that you have people who, despite knowing this, and knowing that all they need to do is just make a profession, uh, to come to terms, uh, and acknowledge, and accept their creator, and then accept the creator's messenger, right, you know, and they can do those things in secret, you know, you know, so they're, they're not good to Allah, you know, who is their 
primary um, and, and actually not your completely, you know, you're not just your primary, but your only true benefactor, right? If the one who actually is giving you everything that you have, right? And you refuse to do so, right? So you can't be so good, right? If you don't give a, a lot of that uh, his due. And it's something very simple that is, you know, actually for something simple, nothing major is asking you for, you know, but that person refuses. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, <coughs> excuse me, the individual um, has every, um, uh, deserves every um, um, distaste, uh, distasteful uh, um, um, or un unpleasantry that, that comes their way in the future. So, so he goes on, he says, well, Imanu huwa iqrar bil lisan wa tasdiqu bil jinan. So it is, Faith entails a searching with the tongue and conviction with the heart. And then there are others who went to the other extreme, of course, who said that conviction of the, uh, you know, uh, utterance with the tongue, right? A searching with the tongue is sufficient, right? So if you if make an assertion, if you search with your tongue that I'm a believer, even if you're hard, you know, you're a, a hypocrite, right? Then that in itself is sufficient for you, your muqiyama. Say, no, it's not, right? It's not, because that in itself is not the true uh, pillar of faith. The true pillar of faith is conviction in the heart. Not the utterance on the tongue. Now, the utterance on the tongue, it can protect you, right? It can, it can, um, when, oh, if, it, if it can earn for you the right to certain rights, R I T E S, right? Like your pray, we pray your janaza, we, uh, we shroud you, you wash you, things like that after you die, right? You know, but the munafiqun, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says more than one time in the Quran, uh, that they 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 took their oaths you know, as a shield, right? Um, um, as a shield, right, to protect them, right? Um, and, and then they then they dissuaded people from the path of God, right? Yeah. So, so in other words, they they say, you know, anna ka you know, we testify that you are God's messenger. And Allah knows that you are his messenger. messenger. And Allah knows that the hypocrites, that they are liars, right? You know, so, so their tongues and their hearts, they don't match, right? You know, but it starts with the heart. The heart is the source of it all. Then he says, all that God revealed in the Quran and all that is verified from the Prophet وسلم, concerning sacred law and its explanation are true. So among the things we believe is that everything that Allah revealed and everything brought by the Messenger is true, uh, is true from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and from his messenger. So that's something, of course, a person of faith would accept. Then he says, But Iman wahidun wa ahluhu fi aslihi sawa. Uh, faith is one reality, and the people of faith are essentially the same. Any disparity among them results from distinctions in knowledge, piety, struggle, and adherence to priorities. So faith is one reality. Faith is one reality. You know, and the faith is tasdiqo and jazim, right? Firm conviction, right? in the heart, right, you know, it's, it's one reality. So here is one of those areas where uh, the author, he actually adopts the position of Abu Mansur al-Maturidi, or he, his position agrees with it, uh, of course, with that of Abu Mansur al-Maturidi uh, um, uh, with respect to uh, the fact that that Iman uh, does not increase or decrease. He doesn't say that expressly, but he says it in a way he's very tactful about this and apparently he was very much aware of the disagreements among the scholars you know because between Abu Mansur Maturidi and Abu Hassan Ashari there was a disagreement about whether or not faith increases or decreases right now and all the one everyone agrees that faith is one reality right at its origin right among the people of faith are essentially the same right you know in other words all of us believe the same things we all believe in the same things right we believe in Allah his messengers his books his angels etc etc that we all believe in those things, right? So essentially it's one reality, right? And of course, uh, um, the love, our conviction, right, about that, right, you know, is the same at its root, it's the same, right? We all believe it's true, right? Now, of course, some people's faith is stronger than other people's, right? And so this is why it's related that Imam Abu Hanifa said uh, that I don't say, Imani misla Imani Jibreel, that my faith is equal to the faith of Gabriel. But he said, I say, 
Imani ka Imani Jibreel. My Iman is like the Iman. My faith is like the faith of Jibreel, but it's not equal to the faith of, of Gabriel, right? Because Gabriel, of course, has uh, greater certainty, right? You know, he created his experiences. He, he communicates with the creator, as we know, et cetera. But if there is anything that would distinguish one person from another with respect to faith, it would be on the basis of taqwa, right? So as uh, any disparity among them results from distinctness in, in knowledge, piety, struggle, and adherence to priorities, right? So the more good works you do, uh, the greater the sign of your faith. The fewer good works you do, the 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 less uh, uh, the 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 lesser of signs of faith that you have. Except that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala He gives different deeds different values, as we know. And for that reason, we can never truly know who has stronger faith than other people. Who really has the strongest strongest faith? We really can't know in this life. Um, uh, you know that you know do not ascribe purity to yourselves Allah he knows best the one who has taqwa Allah he knows who has taqwa right you know so the prophet in the hadith right taqwa is here he points to his heart three different times and so I can open your heart to know for a certain how deep your faith is, how strong it is, what's the intensity of that faith? I don't know. I can't know. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the intensity of that faith. And so we judge people by, by what is apparent uh, from what we can see. You know, so if a person is praying all the nawafil, they're praying all the faraid, they're fasting Ramadan, they're fasting outside of Ramadan, they're giving zakat, they're praying sadaqah. You know, of course, I mean, you say, yeah, this has to be, clearly these are signs of faith of a faithful person, right? Clearly a sign of a faithful person, and I compare myself to that person, and I'm not doing any of those things. If even with the opportunity to do so, if I'm not doing any of that, right, then of course I say, well, uh, it, it, of course that person's better than me, right? But ultimately, Allah truly knows because this could be a hypocrite. We don't really know, right? If this individual is doing all these things for show, right? So, um, so ultimately, uh, since faith is rooted in the heart, uh, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, He is the one who truly determines. Uh, who was upon the right path and who was not. Then he said, All believers are the protected of the beneficent. The noblest of them with God is the most obedient and most adherent to the Quran. So this word that he translates as the protected uh, is the word al-awliya. Al-awliya is a plural of the word wali. And the word wali can be translated as friend or an ally, right? So Imam Tahawi says that the believers, all the believers are the allies of God. All the believers are the friends of God. What is a friend of God? Uh, some translate it as or define it as one uh, who has, has allied himself with the creator through compliance with obedient with all of his commandments and avoidance of all of his uh, 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 all of things that he prohibited, you know uh, another definition would be one who Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has befriended, right? And because of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala befriending you, it is that is what is makes it possible for you to comply with his commandments and avoid his prohibitions, right? So you are a wali, and so the opposite of a wali is an adu, is a an enemy. Right, and so in the Quran, uh, Shaytan is um, is outed as the chief or the adu uh, mubin, the openly or manifest enemy, right, of humanity. So Allah Subhanahu wa Taala often utilizes the language of warfare when He speaks about this, um, uh, the reality of our existence on this planet and this in this world, in this uh, dimension, in this universe, however we like to describe it, uh, and so. There are friends or allies, and there are enemies. There are enemies, right? There are the awliya of shaitan, and there are the awliya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The believers are the awliya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inna ja'anna shiyatina awliya lilladina la yu'minun. And we made the demonics, we made the demonic forces or the demons uh, or these. Um, the evil creatures, we made them the friends or the allies of those who don't have faith, of those who don't believe. That is what the Quran says. You know, but those believers, 
they are the the, the friends of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now later on in the Aqidah, he's going to talk about what is called the Karamat of the Uliya, of the marvels of the Uliya, of the friends of the allies of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now when he's talking about Uliya in that particular section, we're going to see that he's talking about a different type of ally, a different type of friend, a special friend, right? Which is different from the general category of Odia of all the believers. So the believers all are Odia of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are all friends of God. We are all allies of God. Uh, but then God also has special Odia as well, right? And these are individuals upon whose hands certain marvels are manifested because of their piety, because of their conscientiousness, because of their uh, their uh, scrupulousness because of their piety, their asceticism, all these things, right? And then uh, because of these um, attributes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala manifests upon their hands certain marvels, and those marvels are indicative of their sincerity and, and also their acceptance with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so, so we are to believe in the karamat of the uliya. Uh, uh, of course, not every claim of the uliya are we expected to believe in. You know, but we're going to get more into that, inshallah. So all the believers, so all believers are, are the protected of the beneficent. The beneficent is Ar-Rahman. The noblest of them with God is the most obedient and most adherent to the Quran. And this, is, of course, is a direct reference from the verse in Surah Al-Hujurat. In Akramakum and Allahi Atqaqum. The most noble of you in the sight of God are the ones or those with the most taqwa, the most... God consciousness, uh, the God, the most piety. That is fundamentally, this is what he's saying. Yeah. So, um, so some people are closer to God than others, and this is really an interesting and an important uh, point to to reiterate uh, at times is that there are hierarchies, there are spiritual hierarchies, there are political hierarchies, there are social hierarchies, there are um, um, moral hierarchies, there are intellectual hierarchies, right, among the creation, where right? some people know more than others. Um, some people are more moral than others. Um, some people have greater power than other in, or more qualified to have power than other people, right? Um, and then in the spiritual realm, you know, some people uh, have greater certainty or uh, greater conviction than others, right? Um, 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 and so uh, it's, is is it, there are different hierarchies you know so among the uliya there's some who who actually surpass others but imanu huwa al-imanu billahi wa malaikatihi wa kutubihi wa rusulihi wal yawmil akhir wal ba'thi ba'd al mawti wal qadr khayrihi wa sharrihi wa hulwihi wa murrihi min Allah ta'ala faith is belief in god his angels his books his messengers the last day the resurrection after death and the decree is good and evil Sweetness and bitterness are all from God, the sublime and exalted. Right? So a summary of the things <coughs> that our faith is attached to. And then he says, We believe in all of the above. We do not distinguish among any of his messengers, and we affirm all that they brought. And so this idea of the distinction among messengers fundamentally is to say that um, we do not say that some of them are messengers and others are not, right? So Muslims believe in all the messengers and all the prophets. Uh, Jews believe in, of course, all the messengers up to Musa, alayhi salam, of course, in um, Yusha, Joshua, right, who was his successor. Um, but they don't believe in Isa ibn Maryam. They don't believe in Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Um, and Christians believe in Musa, they believe in Jesus, but they don't believe in Muhammad. But we as Muslims, we believe in Jesus, we believe in Musa, and we believe in Muhammad, والسلام, all of them. So we don't do tafriq, we don't make a distinction, meaning that some of them are messengers and others are not messengers. This is really what this means. This does not mean that some messengers are not superior uh, to others. Right. If anything, you have an obligation to believe that some are superior to others. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said it in the Quran, Tilka rusul that these messengers, we have made some superior to others. 
منهم من كلم الله ورفع بعضهم درجات. Among them were those who Allah spoke to directly, and then others He had elevated and grades. Right. So you have an obligation to believe that some messengers are better than others, right? Uh, and if you don't believe that, you're not a Muslim. Why not? Because Allah says so, and either you're telling the truth or he or, or, or he is, right? And we know when there's a, uh, of course, a choice between those two, we know who's telling the truth, right? It can't be you, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he reminds us that there's a tafdeel that does exist, right? Not only among the messengers, but a, a tafdeel among his creation. Right, and we have to also be very careful about this too. Is it's like with the Prophet ﷺ, he talked about in the hadith, and the Sayyidu Walid ibn Adam wa la fakhr, that I am the, the master of all of the children of Adam, and there's and, and there's no the, and without any boast, without any boast, without any pride, right? Right, he just basically acknowledging what he was told that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made him the Sayyid of Bani Adam, right? Right. Um so he acknowledges this. He accepts this rank that Allah has given to him, right? you know. And so, and this, what this to do is create a certain a type of tawadu, a type of humility with us, right? Uh, unfortunately, with people outside of the um, category of the messengers, you find when people learn, okay, hey, God says something positive about your particular category of person, all right? Therefore, you are better than all the members of a different category of person, right? Regardless of their excellence, right? right? And that itself is a, a big problem, as you know, that un unfortunately that people have been tried by this, you know, over and over and over, right? You know, also uh, men and women, over women, et cetera, you know, and, and vice versa, it can be sometimes, you know, but mostly men or women or one race over another race, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give certain people certain advantages, but the, every advantage that you have is a test, is a responsibility, right? And you're not supposed to utilize that advantage uh, to oppress and to tyrannize. And so when you do so, then your punishment will be greater as a result, as a result of that. So he goes on, he says, Muhammadin <laughs> وأهل كبائر من أمة محمد في النار لا يخلدون إذا ماتوا وهم واحدون وإن لم يكونوا تائبين بعد أن لقوا الله عارفين مؤمنين وهم في مشيئته وحكمه إن شاء غفر لهم وعفى عنهم بفضله كما ذكر عز وجل في كتاب العزيز إن الله لا يغفر أي شرك به ويغفر ما دون ذلك لمن يشاء وإن شاء أذبهم في النار بعدله ثم يخرجهم منها برحمته وشفاعة الشافعين من أهل طاعته ثم يبعثهم إلى جنته uh, people of mortal sins among the community of Muhammad وسلم, will not abide in the fire forever as long as they died monotheists. Right. So again, return to this point once again. That um, so just as we don't we don't assign anyone to hell or to Jannah or, the, or heaven. Um, um, because we can't know that unless God has told us specifically or has told us through his messenger, alayhi salatu right? Um, we also embrace the teachings of our Prophet, وسلم, which is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take out of the fire the person who has mithqadu khardanim min iman, that person has a mustard grain or mustard seed uh, amount of faith in their hearts, that a day will come where Allah will bring out all of those people from the hellfire. Right, so people of mortal sins, the people of the Kaba'er, the people who commit major sins, right, from the community of Muhammad will not abide in the fire forever. So, I mean, they will go to the fire, but they won't abide there forever. The rejectors of faith will go to the fire and they will abide there forever, right? So, in other words, those people who got the message and they rejected the message, they understood the consequences and they still did not embrace it. Um, so those who from the Ummah of Muhammad وسلم, meaning those who believe in Allah and His Messenger, as long as they are monotheists, uh, they will not go to abide in hellfire forever. This includes even the unrepentant that nonetheless met God as knowing believers. In other words, there are certain misdeeds uh, we believe will only be forgiven um, if a person uh, makes toba and Allah accepts that toba from them. Uh, they repent and Allah accepts their repentance from them. Right? 
So we usually classify these as the major sins, right? You know, so the minor sins are the ones that fall off when we make wudu, when we make salah, for instance. You make wudu, sins of your hands you may have touched something you shouldn't have touched, you know, the sins of your hands fall off. That you look at something you're not supposed to look at, the eyes, the sins of your eyes, they fall off from the water, wudu. Things you listen to, you're not supposed to listen to, the sins of those fall off when the water, it trails down your face from your ears. If it's same thing for your feet, you walk to certain places, you use your feet for certain things that you shouldn't have done, then the sins of those, they are removed through wudu and then your salah, you know. So, but then there are other sins that are much more severe, much more mortal, or they are mortal sins, or they are severe, serious, much more serious sins, which require tova, right? Um, you know, murder, um, um, riba, um, 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 abandoning uh, the uh, the battlefield. Um, uh, there, there, there are hadith, many hadith about this. You know, disrespecting your parents, right? Uh, idolatry, um, lying. There are many different examples of this, right? In our in our tradition, right? And so, um, destroying someone's property. So you have to make toba from those things. So fundamentally, what this is this 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 verse is saying is that even if you haven't made toba. That and you go to the hellfire because of that, that you still will come out of the hellfire eventually. Um, come out of hellfire eventually. If you are a a muwahid, you are an individual who declared God's oneness, you believe in God's oneness, and you're from the Ummah of Muhammad, وسلم, which also means that you believe in the Messenger. وسلم. So it says, they are in his judgment and decree, meaning God's judgment and God's decree. So if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he wants to Punish them, he'll punish them. If he cho chooses to not punish them, then that's his choice, right? And this is, uh, I, I made reference to a hadith before related to the abandonment of prayer, because the abandonment of prayer also an example of, of a major sin, the abandonment of prayer, right? And so there's a hadith of Muwatta ibn Ma'amadik, which says, yeah, there are five prayers that Allah has made compulsory upon the person during the night and day, but maja'a that whoever uh, performs them and does not squander any of them uh, out of belittlement of their right, then that individual has a covenant with God, a pact, an agreement with God that he will enter them into paradise. Uh, and whoever does not fulfill them, then that person has no pact with God. That if he wills, he will punish the person. If he wills, he will forgive him. So the individual, that person who is not made toba from their misdeeds, are in the God's judgment and God's decree. That's Mashiach. So you might be forgiven, but you might not be forgiven. Right? Yes. If you're not forgiven, we know what's going to happen. Right? If he pleases, he forgives and pardons them by his grace. Right? As he mentioned in his book, Surely God does not forgive idolatry, but he forgives anything less of whomever he pleases. Or if he pleases, he punishes them in the fire by his justice and then removes them by his grace and through the intercession of those so granted among his obedient servants, he then sends them to his paradise. So in other words, what is it saying that there's more than one reason uh, why you can be spared from eternal damnation right? one can be that <clears throat> that you don't commit major sin so your good deeds will outweigh your bad deeds because right? this particular verse is talking about the people of Kabat right if you're not from the people of Kabat then inshallah you're safe right? yeah. the Yom Qiyamah when our deeds are, are weighed then your good deeds should outweigh your bad deeds right because of all of the many good deeds that you've done right so that's one the basis for forgiveness. Um, another basis for forgiveness, if it turns out that you're from the Kaba'a, people of Kaba'a, um, and you haven't made toba, that you're in Allah's Mashiach, right? So if Allah's Mashiach, his will or his decree, um, it so happens, uh, results in you being forgiven, then you'll be forgiven, right? Just by God's sheer choice. He decides, okay, well, uh, no, 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 Jahannam for you. Um, another, in which we, and we understand from that the opposite too, which would be that 
if you were an individual committed major sin and you actually make toba, sincere toba in this life before you meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you won't be punished for that when you meet God, inshallah. Right. So 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 your you, your people of Sagha'er, but not Kabir, you go to Jannah, inshallah, because your 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 good deeds outweigh in your bad. You make toba uh, from your misdeeds, your good deeds outweigh your bad, you go to Jannah, right? If you don't make toba, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chooses to forgive you, you'll go to Jannah, right? But then he also he adds among this things the intercession uh, of those granted, so granted among his obedient servants, right? So the intercession of those granted intercession also be the basis of you being spared from punishment in the fire, right? Um, so, and then of course, um, if we can talk about eternal punishment, if you're a believer, you're not going to be there forever anyway, you know, but, you know, temporary punishment as well. Like, there can be basis for Allah bringing you out of, uh, uh, out of, out of hellfire, but the eternal damnation also is, is, is ward off by the very fact that you have la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. So that is going to be your ticket out of the hellfire, right? So there are many different ways to come out of the hellfire, right? But we don't want to go there for even a moment, right? A moment's time. May Allah spare us from the hellfire. So, so, so this is uh, these are some things to reflect reflect upon. He says, so, so, so after that, he will send the person, send them to his paradise. When he said, "But that is that Allah Taala to build the ahlam arifati, and not to make them in the darin as ahlam nukrati, the ones who have been deprived of his hidayah and have not been deprived of his hidayah." اللهم يا ولي الإسلام وأهله مسكنا بالإسلام حتى نلقاك به. said the, the the above is such because God protects those who acknowledge Him. God protects those who acknowledge Him. And so which is what we we're talking about before, right? You know, so and so is a good person, right? Um, he gives charity. He's always nice. You know, I speak well to people. Doesn't backbite people, but he doesn't believe in God. He's a good person. Why would God send him help? Right? Well, he doesn't acknowledge God. So, so God protects those who acknowledges him. You know? So even those who are wicked people, right? But they acknowledge God. <laughs> they have a, a better chance of coming out of the hellfire than those who are, for the most part, they were upright people in this life, but they did not acknowledge God. God protects those who acknowledge him. He will not treat them in either of the two abodes as he treats his deniers who are destitute of his guidance and bereft of his protection. And then he makes a prayer, makes a dua. Allahumma la wali al-Islami wa ahli masikna bil-Islami hatta naqaqa bih. O God, protector of Islam and its adherents, root us firmly in Islam until we meet you in that state. Amin. So that's uh, what Imam Tahawi had to say about this. And then the next um, verse, he shifts into a different topic and we'll begin talking about that next week, inshallah. An important topic related to the matter of prayer behind um, unrighteous people and also the, the matter of, of uh, respecting and obe obeying our governors, inshallah. Uh, so with that, we'll conclude uh, at least the lecture portion, you know. So, if there are maybe a couple questions, I don't know how many people actually are online, but you know, um, if there's one or two questions, I'll take that. Inshallah. If not, uh, we can conclude, and all is uh, good for me. Inshallah. Barakallahu fikum. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala Sayyidina Muhammad ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. What is shirk? Shirk is a word which means partnership. Um, it is the word which also translates as idolatry. Um, so Islam forbids idolatry, meaning bowing and prostrating and praying to an idol, but it also forbids uh, worshiping <clears throat> other than God, and it also forbids worshiping God along with other people, other things which we claim to be gods along with him or share the partnerhood, partnerhood with him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All three of those things are considered to be what we call shirk. And so shirk generally is divided into two types. One is called shirk al-akbar, uh, major shirk, major idolatry. And then shirk al-asghar, uh, subtle or, or minor idolatry. 
uh, the major idolatry or blatant worship of something other than God or something along with God or um, uh, bowing to an idol. Uh, but minor shirk uh, is, um, there are many different examples of this, you know, and this is actually one of the things the Prophet said that he feared most for his ummah. Uh, right? So one of the things I fear for you most, I'm most fearful for, for my ummah, is subtle idolatry, you know, in which he called ostentation, showing off, you know, as an example, subtle idolatry. When you show off, meaning you're doing something for other than God's sake, then that in itself is a type of idolatry too, because you're seeking the pleasure of the creation, right? And, and, and this especially applies if you're performing an act of worship um, and say, for instance, a person is leading a prayer and, you know, they generally recite the Quran one way, but then they decide to embellish it a bit more now because they're being followed by people and they know that uh, people, they enjoy listening to them recite that way. So they do it simply because uh, the people are now present right? or a person uh, may not pray any of this sunnahs at home, but then they go to the masjid and then all of a sudden you feel this energy. So I'm going to pray sunnah now. Now, it doesn't mean that you should not pray it. You should pray it still. You know, and, and the individual who is tested by um, being impressed with their own voice, their beautiful voice, they should continue to recite with a beautiful voice. You know, but it just takes time for us to rid ourselves of the subtle forms of idolatry. Right? Um, as a matter of fact, the uh, Sufis say that the last thing to leave the heart of the murid, of the initiative, is uh, the love of status. Uh, the love of leadership, the love of status, you know, and that is the hardest thing to remove from the heart of the human being. Because every human being, of course, likes to be pampered. But other human being likes to be complimented. Um, um, we like for people to look up to us, right? You know, so uh, so the prophet said that he 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 feared for that most of, of out of all things. He feared for, for that most. Uh, you know, he didn't fear that that the Ummah was going to go back to idolatry, physical idolatry, but he feared. Uh, subtle uh, idolatry, you know, and whereas we start to worship people, we start to worship money, we start to worship our our own egos, our own lust, right, to all those things. So Islam's monotheism is radical monotheism, right, it's unlike monotheism even in uh, Judaism and Christianity. What can we do to become friends uh, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? I mean, there's a hadith Qudsi where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that um, I am as my servant thinks of me and I am with him whenever he mentions me. Uh, if he mentions me when he's alone, then I mention him when I'm with myself, right? In the karani fi nafsihi, the kartu fi nafsi. If he mentions him, of course, you are thinking about God, then I think if he thinks of me, if you think of God, then God will think of you. Uh, and if he thinks of me or mentions me in a group, a gathering, then I will mention him in a gathering um, greater and more noble than that gathering that you mentioned me in, right? Uh, so dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the pathway to friendship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, and so, so, so thinking of God, um, and if you don't think of God, you have to start a regular regimen of of mentioning God, right? If you don't mention God, then you're not going to think of God that much. Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already given us the five prayers you know, as a start for that. You know, well, you know, you know, and perform the salat for my remembrance, as the Quran says, right? You know, so time comes one hour, then two hours later, you have to pray again. Two hours later or three hours later, you have to pray again, right? So you can continue to remember God already, right? But you add to that your tasbih, your tahmid, your takbir, your tahleed. Um, you, you read the Quran, you're listening to the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala recited to you. You mention to people who speak about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You mix with people who are engaged in, in the members of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, so, and, and that is the, the, the easiest way, the quickest way to um, become a friend of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in time and through that interaction, you'll learn all the other things that will bring you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, as 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 a hadith, another hadith mentions, it says, uh, man shibran, 
تَقَرَّبْتُ إِلَيْهِ دِرَاءً That whoever uh, nears me, a draw near to me, approaches me a hand span, I will draw near to them an arm span, right? Uh, uh, so it's um, so so Allah is like saying basically, if you if you decide to turn towards me, I'll I'll come closer to you than you come towards me, right? So so it's, it's a relationship, right, that you develop, right? You know? So if you want to be my friend, you know, if you decide that you want to be my friend, then God will He will oblige that. He said, okay, well, you know, so 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 yeah, you're trying to come close to me. Okay, oh, I'll, I'll come a bit closer to you. I'll make it easy for you, right? I make it easy for you, right? Yeah. So uh, you only take, take, take an inch. Okay, I'll I'll move uh, a mile a mile closer to you, right? You know, you move an inch, I'll move a mile, right? So if you're sincere, then Allah will know that, and then eventually you'll become Allah's friend, inshallah. So you also ask, um, what should what should we uh, what should, uh, I guess what should we read? I guess to understand better. Um, I guess. Uh, what a friend of Allah, a better about being a friend of Allah more. I'm not, maybe have to re, it looked like some, some mistakes, it looks like Bilal in your question, right? So if you uh, maybe reword it so that way I can fully understand it before I try to answer it. And then, uh, Rahman said, God protects us all. I mean, and uh, what it can for your, your uh, esteem that you gave at the beginning. Um, but I, I want you to reword your 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 question. You know, so you have the question: of What should read to understand better? N G A friend of Allah more. That's what your question says, and I, I don't. It's not coherent for me. You know, so you just uh, rewrite it. So what should I read to understand better? Other than the Quran. Uh, which which you understand to read to a uh, better to a uh, uh, friend of Allah other than the Quran, I mean I mean there are many many different things you could you could read um, and um, um, but I I generally try to point people first to uh, the prophetic um, uh, you know uh, invocations right you know so for instance if you got a book like uh, Imam Nawawi's Kitab al Atkar right book on um, special mentions of God, you know, that would be a good uh, place to start um, where he has uh, many different examples of special prayers of the Prophet Sallallahu that he made, you know, and also, I mean, um, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi was one who was in 100% uh, of 24 hours a day in remembrance of God. Everything he did was about the of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Now, when he woke up, he remembered Allah. You know, he had special prayer for when he woke up. He prayed by special prayer before he went into the bathroom. He had a special prayer, you know, uh, before he started wudu, special prayer after he made wudu, uh, he went into the bathroom, into the of course the, the the laboratory with his left foot, and he came up with his right foot. And he went to the masjid, he entered into the masjid with his right foot, and he came up with his left foot. Before going to the masjid, there was a prayer that he made. Coming out of the the masjid, there's a prayer he made. When he was putting on his clothes, he put it right before left. And he he had a special prayer he made for putting on his clothes. He took off his clothes, left left right. You know, special prayers for that. He he had. Um, uh, um, you know, when he combed his hair a certain way, brushed his teeth, all, you know, they're all, they're, he's constantly in remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he's doing istighfar, right? <laughs> and when he doesn't need to, right? But to show us that, you know, ask Allah's forgiveness, you know, you're always falling short in some way, right? Because when we consider the fact that they, again, they're spiritual hierarchies, right? So one person's good deed is another person's sin, right? Um, uh, and so, and vice versa, it could be, yeah, you know, uh, just depending on on the situation. So, so of course, the litanies, uh, you know, the the Afkar of Noe, for instance, would probably be a good book to to start. Um, you uh, uh, there's, um, you know, I mean, Mamanoe, his his his, um, uh, his special books on du'a. Uh, outside of that, um, uh, the uh, Wirfs of Imam Noe. There's the um, you know, uh, with Latif, there's you know, a lot of different types of orad, right, that do exist, you know, that people do, just depending on the different um, tariqas that people take, you know, but, you know, that's um, that's a different story altogether, whether or not, you know, follow tariqa, you know, I'm not encouraging it, or also not discouraging it either, but, um, but again, is this, it's, it's, you remember, so iman, the, it's in the heart, right, conviction is there, right, right, 
uh, convictions there. And that's where everything emanates is from the heart, right? So, um, so if you sincere about your desire to become a friend of God, right? Then you do the things that will help you to remember God always, right? In the same way that you want to remember your friend or you want your friend to remember you, right? You know, so you want to be concerned about what is happening with your friend, what your friends, what are your friends, your friends, and what type of things that your friend likes, right? You know, and your friend in turn, uh, who wants to maintain the relationship with you, will do similar things with you as well, inshallah. Um, yes, good, correct, Iman in the heart. So, um, so a question about the writings of Ibn Arabi. Uh, and so we're talking about the Ibn Arabi and the Sufi, right? The Muhyiddin Ibn Arabi. Um, not, not all of his books are problematic. I mean, the his Tadbir, Fi Isqat Tadbir, his Tanwir Fi Isqat Tadbir is an acceptable, a very accessible book. You know, there's nothing wrong with it. Um, there's um, one particular book which is the most controversial of all of them called Fusul Sat Hikam, right? Um, and scholars historically have taken three, uh, one of three uh, different positions about Ibn Arabi. Um, the first two positions were the positions of Sufis, and the other was a the anti Ibn Arabi faction, right? So the first position was that uh, Ibn Arabi is a wali, is a saint, you know, uh, but we don't read his books. Uh, and the reason that they say don't read his books was because he wrote in a very um, esoteric fashion, right? That only people with special learning would understand, at least according to the, I'm not saying the desiccation about it, but this is what the claim is, is that, you know, because there's a lot of, it's very esoteric <clears throat> in the way that he writes. Um, and so uh, the average person wouldn't understand him. And then add, add on top of that, they would say that his enemies place in his books things he never said. Right. Right. So this first opinion says, he was a wali, but we don't read his books. The second opinion was that he was wali and we read his books, except that we have to read it with a scholar who understands his language, right? So those who can decipher the enigmas of Ibn, Ibn Arabi's works, you know, you should find someone who is an expert in the writings of Ibn Arabi to sit down and study them with that particular person so you can understand those problematic areas of his writings, right? So that's the second opinion, right? So first opinion is don't read his books at all. He's acknowledged he's a good person. He was a wali, you know, don't read his books. Second, um, um, we acknowledge him to be wali and we don't read his books. Um, I mean, um, yeah, you don't read his book. The first thing he said, you, you do read his books, but you read his books with the teacher. And then the third opinion was the anti-Ibn Arabi faction, which stated that uh, Ibn Arabi was a kafir, right? You know, which was a position of um, um, Hafiz Dhabi and um, his teacher and, and some of his associates, like uh, Ibn Taymiyyah and uh, Ibn Qayyim Josiah. Uh, or we would say for Ibn Taymiyyah to be to get to to do to, to do him justice, um, Ibn Taymiyyah in his Kitab at Tasawwuf among his much 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 more to Fatawa, uh, he has a book called the Book of Sufism, right, in his uh, collections of fatwas, right, and um, he's not antagonistic towards Sufism. As a matter of fact, he's believed to have been a Qadiri Sufi, right? but what was known or actually um, um, said to have been uh, the views of Ibn Arabi, um, he said that they were tantamount to Kufa. Um, but he also would say things like, if he, you know, if he meant this, then he then Kafir, if he didn't, if he meant this other thing, then he's okay. Right. So, uh, but he apparently did not believe that um, Ibn Arabi's beliefs were in line with the acceptable interpretation of his words, right? Uh, at least based upon the um, famous um, alleged. Um, debate that he had with uh, Ibn Atayla's Eskande, right? Whereas it said that he uh, debated with Ibn Taymiyyah about um, Ibn Arabi's views, and and Ibn Taymiyyah towards the end of the debate had supposedly said that you know that uh, this is all nice if only your your companion believes it, right? <laughs> but uh, 
Uh, at any rate, a lot of those rest of that ever, ever really happened, you know, but that's, that's what was, was related about them, you know. So, so three basic positions. And then um, Hafiz al Dahabi, the Shafi'i Hadith scholar, who also studied with Imam Ibn Taymiyyah, who was a Hanbali, uh, he actually said about Ibn, um, Ibn Arabi's book, Fasus al Hikam, uh, that if there's no kufr in this book, then there's no kufr in the dunya. So, uh, so. That's the situation with regard to Ibn Arabi and his words, and so. But um, I've I've read the the his Tanwir you know, before, and I didn't find really anything problematic in it. Uh, but um, you know, I've, I haven't uh, delved into the Fusul uh, um, uh particularly because of the prohibitions or the discouragement of learned people. Uh, there's some people I know who have studied it, um, and. Um, uh, he also has his Futahat Makia, which is an important book as well. Right? And parts of it are really um, uh, esoteric, you know, really difficult to understand, you know, but other parts of it, most of it is easier, it is accessible, at least to put it like this, uh, the, the parts that I've, I've read from that particular um, um, collection of books, right? The Futahat Makia. All right, any other questions? All right, so inshallah, um, we're going to keep you updated uh, about the, the our coming classes. Inshallah, we, we, we're going to uh, transition back to Saturday and Sunday. Inshallah, at the one o'clock uh, time. Uh, if something changes, we'll we'll let you know. Uh, if uh, those other times, uh, if there's some other times that might work better, you know. But we're going to go back to Saturday and Sunday for now until we need to take another break. Inshallah. So next week we're going to be talking about. Uh, the question of of, of 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 the Muslim governors, whether or not there's an obligation to obey them and when you obey them and when you don't obey them, whether or not rebellion is lawful and why this actually is um, play, placed in a book of creed uh, um, and is embraced as the Sunni mainstream position, um, you know, and, and so, and, and, and whether or not it's, it's ever possible, permissible to rebel against a Muslim governor, inshallah. So with that, we we'll conclude. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless you all, that he increases all the knowledge and wisdom and to uh, make us all sincere or keep us sincere, keep our feet firm upon his path, inshallah, and to forgive us for our shortcomings uh, and do not um, um, test us uh, with the hellfire, spare us from the hellfire, inshallah. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad wa alayhi wa sallam 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 wa